Um, even from the first semester, we've uh, you know, looked at the scripture and we studied uh, praise and worship, John chapter 4. And this is the conversation uh, of Lord Jesus with the woman at the well and, and how he describes or defines worship. And he he says that it is spirit and truth worship. John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. Right? The hour is coming and now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So the Lord um, gives no, no other option. Or no room for option. It says those who worship must worship in spirit and truth. And this is the spirit and truth worship or spirit and truth worshippers is the one that the Father is seeking. Right? So um so as we pray, you know, we'll just say, Lord, uh, let me return to spirit and truth worship. You know, if if it, if not, if we have not been um worshipping in spirit and truth. As you say, Lord, let me return to that place of uh, worshipping in, in spirit and truth, worshipping, worshipping from my innermost being, worshipping in truth. Um, may I return to that place. Let there be no hypocrisy. Let there be no pretense. Um, let my worship be out of sincerity. Let me worship when no one is watching. Let me worship when everybody is watching. You know, just go ahead and just pray. Just talk to the Lord. Father, we we thank you, Lord, for this awesome privilege of knowing you, Lord, of calling you and uh, calling your name. Uh, Lord, you've given us the awesome, awesome privilege of drawing near to you, Lord Jesus. <clears throat> the Lord of heaven and earth draws near to us when we draw near to him. Lord, what, a, what an awesome, awesome privilege. We thank you. And Father God, even as we draw near to you today, Lord, may we experience, Lord, may we have that experience of you drawing near to us. Your presence is unmistakable, God. Your power is unmistakable, God. So tangible, Father God. So even as we pray, Lord, Lord, let your presence overshadow, overshadow everything else, Father God. Let your power overshadow, God situations, circumstances, symptoms, Lord, whatever it is, let your power overshadow it, Father God. Let your power, God, make a change, make a difference, make a way where there seems to be no way, Father God. Yes, Lord, we worship you as the healer. We worship you as the deliverer. We worship you as the provider. We worship you as our savior, O oh God. We worship you, Father God. And Lord, even as we draw near, your word says that when we draw near to you, we need to draw near in faith, Lord, that acknowledging that you are who you said you are, God, and you are a rewarder of those who diligently seek you. Lord, we thank you, Father God. Yes, Lord, your mere presence, Lord, your very presence, Father God, is reward enough. But Lord, you add all these things, other things, when we seek you. We thank you, Lord. We bless your name. We give you all the praise and all the glory at this time. In Jesus' matchless name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so um, we, I think we are, we are nearing the end. Uh, this is the end game <laughs> right, of uh, worship ministry. Kind of uh, done thing at a very brisk pace, I guess. Um, so we've come to the last, uh, the final chapter. But I, I just felt that uh, you know there could be some things that we can add, we can look at in the coming days, which are which are not there in the notes. But um, I'll also share the notes um, as and when we go along. Maybe a maybe a few maybe a few sessions, right? Few more sessions. Um, okay, so. Um, let me just share the notes, and we look at today's um, class. And okay. Um, okay. So um, we're looking at uh, this chapter, chapter number eight, worship ministry 
indigenous and regional language expression. So last class, we looked at this um, whole aspect of um, you know, moving or developing, creating a culture of worship. We looked at that, you know, those four stages of um, there has to be teaching, which brings revelation and conviction, leading to action and, and the whole destiny and the culture of the gathering changes. You know, it's remarkable to see that change where um, where people were not worshippers, you know, becoming worshippers um, because of that depth in relationship and because of the, the revelation they've received about worship and willing to step out uh, in, in faith and worship, willing to step out. And, and that worship coming from that place of intimacy and relationship with the Lord, right? So uh, it's amazing to see that change. And uh, uh, I personally uh, have been a witness to that, you know, in so many scenarios, like I remember a, a team which used to lead worship. So they come from various backgrounds and I, and I saw them, uh, you know, how they used to lead. And um, it was more of a performance, you know, they'll perform the song um, say something about the next song, perform that song, say something about the next song, perform that song, and, and so on. So um, it was it was just, it was that. But their hearts were so sincere and on fire that they they moved from that place of, um, you know, just calling out the song and playing that song to being worshippers. And um, I, I saw them actually at a 24-7 you know, worship uh, uh, worship night or worship time and it was there that I first saw them that um, that they would you know sing the song but then they themselves were had a uh, and a, had a remarkable transformative um, encounter with God during those you know the 24/7 worship um, time and uh, and then uh, their lives were changed uh, and they were drawn into such depth of worshiping the Lord um, in their own personal lives and together as a team. That the, the next time when I saw them, it was it was a, you know it was a remarkable. It was a change. There was so much uh, authority and so much uh, um, you know uh, the, the the way they led worship, and it was coming from a place of deep intimacy, right? And um, so it was amazing. I think you you know uh, you may have heard of that team. Pastor Roshan was part of Living Waters, and uh, you know that's the team I'm talking about. And I've I've also told them, you know, personally, you know, such a change. And so, uh, so this whole thing, you know, when the culture of worship changes, when the expression and everything changes, it's amazing. You know, you see that you walk in and it uh, walk in a deeper relationship with the Lord. That's that's where it starts. Um, and of course, receiving the whole revelation of uh, worship itself, right? So, so we looked at that last class about the about the culture shift and uh, in worship itself. So, so it can be any uh, any group, any congregation, right? We can't write them off as long as they have the love for the Lord and as long as they receive the word and as long as they're open to being led by the Holy Spirit. The change. A change is possible, and uh, uh, we've seen that change, right? So, so praise God for that. Okay, so today uh, we are looking at indigenous expressions. Indigenous means something that is native of that land, right? So, uh, something that belongs to that particular land or, or language group. Indigenous and regional language expressions, right? So, um, we live in a country which is very complex right? in fact they call india a nation of nations right and uh, i think um, during the mentoring hour we were looking at how there are almost 2700 plus people groups okay so when we say people groups it's within a language it's within a language they have different cultures, different uh, you know, different traditions. Um, they could be speaking Hindi, but then within the Hindi-speaking you know uh, group itself, there are so many different people groups. So there are two thousand seven hundred. So it's, India is really a nation of nations. So it's difficult to pinpoint and say, okay, 
this uh, you know this congregation this is their culture or this is you know we cannot say that everyone comes from you know different backgrounds so it makes it all the more complex it makes it interesting exciting but also it becomes very very complex right so uh, so we're talking about worshiping the lord in uh, because we are you know in the local language we're talking about the local language and and uh, what are some uh, some things that we need to be mindful of okay so so as a church you know for a uh, one example uh, that I can share is that we had two, stu uh, two students. Um, this is the one of the earlier batches. So uh, they were sons of uh, a pastor who had a church in Chennai, Tamil Nadu. So they came here, they were students, and they were really, you know, they were urban. They were kind of urban in their outlook and uh, very uh, contemporary in everything. So they, they just loved the worship. Uh, of uh, you know, APC that we used to have corporate times of worship and also in the Bible college and uh, and the kind of uh, songs that we used to sing and all that so you know those days we used to say do a lot of hill song and so they they went back to their church and then they they introduced those songs right they said guys we need to do this and they were very disappointed because the congregation would not budge the congregation would not engage in worship so they came back after the summer holidays and they were very disappointed said, uh, you know pastors you know we tried doing this but then i think the church is you know the congregation is dead they would not respond so i asked them what kind of songs you know what are the songs they said no, we, we did all these songs that we do here and they would not respond so then I, we asked them we had the discussion and said okay what are the kind of people who come Right? What is the demograph of the people? What language do they speak? And what is their mother tongue? And where do they come from? And then, then we realized it's a it's a very semi-urban and a rural uh, congregation, and you know, not very familiar with other languages and uh, and also the genre of music. Right? So for them, you know, they would become spectators whenever these this kind of songs or music was played they would immediately switch into spectator mode and disengage from worship because they could not right they could not relate to the song they could not understand so they would switch into that mode so um then you know we had the discussion and said hey you need to change you know you need to shift yes there could be some younger people that could be a minority there but then uh, as you're serving this congregation remember that you know, as you're leading worship and in worship ministry, you're serving, right? facilitating people to worship in spirit and truth. And so, um, so do what is you know, uh, don't don't do uh, these kind of this kind of music or, or song. You know, don't do it because that's what you like, or that is what is trending, or that is what is popular. But but find out what is it that the where the church is, and take them from there. Right. So. Um, so several things, right? One is the language, the the genre of music, and also the uh, with their journey with the Lord and the journey. What is the culture of worship there? So all that matters. So, uh, so we we talked about that, right? So, um, so when we look at uh, you know that's that's some of the things that we need that uh, that come into play when we consider the the location of the church where the church is and particularly in a nation like india like we said you know it's a nation of nations so we need to be uh we need it, it's complex right um i remember having a conversation with uh, with a church member and then she was very disappointed she said you know hey we are indians and uh, therefore we need to uh, we need to have and she was a very modern you know uh, urban person she said hey we are indians we need to use indian instruments like tabla and sitar and uh, veena and uh, you know all these indian instruments you need to use and you need to sing in indian languages you know we're not westerners and uh, to you know to sing in you know the language in english and we need to use uh, um, and she said this in english right so th then i i just uh, i was just thinking and then um i remember is thinking about it and saying that um you know even though i and, and then I, I think I, I was speaking for many of us we come from uh yes we are in india we are from um you know maybe in city or rural whatever backgrounds but sometimes we use a language to communicate which is not an indian language and like you know english for example 
And typically in a city, we have a whole generation which is like that. Right? If you look at my hometown, we would all speak Tamil with one another. Right? So when I shift in church, right? So when I shifted to Bangalore, I noticed that it was multicultural. And I also noticed that it was cosmopolitan, which means that there were people from different states here. So the one common language was English. Right? If you move to Hyderabad, like you realize that, yeah, there could be people from different states. And maybe there's a lot of people from from the north as well. And you see a lot of Hindi being spoken right uh, there. Uh, uh, it's it's a mix mix of English and Hindi and more of Hindi. I noticed that in some of the you know the urban churches right in Hyderabad. So you see these differences. Even though we we are Indians, you know we are from this nation, but you see this difference uh, in the language which we relate to you know, or communicate with, or even work in as a working professional that you speak. No, not, it's not to say that one language is better than the other it's just a mode of communication right so um like and, and also uh, you know it, it 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 becomes even more complex because like for me personally right, when i came to the lord um it was in a in a youth uh, camp you know and then i came to the lord when i spoke to the lord right when i prayed and spoke to the lord it was in english right even though we would speak Tamil at home, even though among friends we would speak in Tamil. But when I when I prayed and accepted the Lord and spoke to the Lord, because of the, everything, the teaching and everything was in English. I I spoke to Him in English. I prayed in English, right? So and that's the language I use to relate to God, right? Uh, so that's what comes naturally. Right? So you see that there are see these are several layers of complexity when it comes to regions, right? So. So what do we do, right? So, so that's a decision that, um, as a church leader or a uh, or a worship ministry leader, we need to take. That's a call that we need to take. What is our congregation? Who is our congregation, right? And uh, and then uh, and uh, and also, you know, and it's so closely linked to the vision, right? Because in the vision, you are called to serve. You know, if you're establishing a church, you are called to a certain group of people, right? Uh, you are called to maybe a, you know, uh, the Lord puts a burden to a certain you know, group of people, like how Paul went to the, he went to minister, like to the gen, uh, to the, uh, to the Gentiles, right? Uh, and Peter was sent to the Jews. Predominantly, right? So similarly, you know, we also uh, the Lord gives a burden, the Lord gives a vision, and so you know, you're there establishing that church and ministering. To, so that's the that's where you're seeing fruit, right? So when we are using songs in worship corporately, it's good to consider what language uh, is ideal, what language is suitable, because um, that's the language of the majority, maybe, and uh, can use it right and also consider the genre of music okay so what is a genre of music is that it's a kind of music that is played right um, it's a type of music you know it could be it could be contemporary it could be traditional it could be uh, classical you know so all these things you know it could be like a folk uh, kind of thing like uh, just recently we went to uh, we went to uh, a mission trip to Kalyan, a church in Kalyan, and had the conference there. And and the songs they sang in worship, of course, it was all in Hindi, the whole service. The songs they sang, um, they, I'm sorry, sorry, the songs they sang were, um, were in Hindi, but most of them like had a, like a, a village folk kind of a, it was from that genre, right? Of course, they sang the songs which, uh, which we would, uh, which, which we could identify, uh, like some of the, you know, Eshu Thera Nam and Ashik Thera and um, 
and uh, some of those other songs, right? So, which which we see uh, contemporary Hindi songs, Hindi songs of worship. So we, some of those songs also, um, but most of it, I would say, ninety percent, ninety ninety five percent of the songs were uh, of a of a folk and village and that kind of a it had that kind of a genre, right? So so. Um, so the, even within the language, you see that there are, uh, you know, differences and distinctions, right? So what you need to consider that, right? When we, when we lead in worship, so, uh, so even in a place like, um, uh, I remember going to a for a for a conference in Siliguri, right? We had people uh, from Calcutta and uh, and all other from some other places in West Bengal, and they would come there. Uh, they had come for this uh, uh, from this con for this conference, and and uh, we led in worship. And I think I remember sharing this. I, we led in worship. We led we led some of the contemporary Hindi worship. It was all in Hindi with translation so we led in worship the songs were in hindi it was contemporary hindi but then we we noticed that you know they were not engaging right? they were not engaging in worship they would um, you know they were kind of lethargic and you know but then there was another team which came on day two and they were from kolkata and uh, and the kind of music and the kind of songs they played was very folksy Right, very, uh, we would say, like a rural thing. The beat and everything was tempo and everything, and we could see the same crowd. You know, I, I distinctly remember one one person who used to yawn, you know, during the worship time, but that same person was jumping up and down and dancing. Right, so the genre of music, right, so that is something that would relate to, and even in our own. You know, APC North. I remember at at one point, there it was full of um, you know African students, and I remember going to schedule it, being scheduled to preach a particular Sunday, and I I just went up front and saw that there were about you know, I think those days we used to have lots of students, lots of African students, and I and I and I uh, yeah even before I went there, you know, there was the, the person who led in. Uh, a lot of volunteers, and everybody is serving uh, African students. So, um, the person who led in prayer was an African boy, you know, boy, I think from Uganda. Then the persons, the, the team which led in worship that day was mostly African students again. <laughs> and uh, so they even sang one, you know, one song in Swahili. Um, then, um, yeah, so. So when I went up to preach, I saw that you know it was as if I was preaching to a congregation uh, which was in Africa, right? All of them. So um, you know, so so what kind of worship, what kind of songs would we use, right? So so that is what we are talking at. So we, talking about. So we, it's good to consider. It's good to think about, consider, and see what will serve the congregation better, right? Okay, so. Uh, some things practically that we can think of is, you know, we could have an additional service. Let's say, you know, we have more and more of people of, um, you know, that particular language or that particular language group who are coming. So um, you you could try and have uh, an additional service. You know, if that, let's say the church is like 100 uh, people are coming and then even if like 40 people, you know, are from that language group, that means that, hey, we need to facilitate Right? How can we do that? Uh, it's possible to have, if it's possible to have an additional service in that language, that would be great. Right? Where the preaching, teaching, worship, everything can be in that language. Um, if that is not possible logistically or for what a cost or whatever reason uh, for that particular season, then you could try bilingual. Right? Now this has to be done well, it because it it means that you tailor the whole service. Uh, to be bilingual, so bilingual is two languages. So uh, a lot of churches uh, do that in Bangalore. You have a lot of ch churches who do that, and sometimes they have three languages as well. So you need to consider it's going to take time. Right? So everything is going to take time. Uh, the message is going to take time because it's being translated. Um, the worship time, well, you could have a set time, but um, if it's bilingual, then you could uh, you would be singing the same thing in English and then singing the same song 
I mean, in whatever language, two languages. So um, the number of it limits the number of songs that you can sing, and then also the time uh, you know spent in worship as well. So, so that those are some things, right? And also, <clears throat> not all the songs have translations, right? Not all the songs. So, which means you can consider translating as well, right? Um, and also singing a few songs. So you sing a few songs in the in the first language and sing a completely you know set of songs in the second language. Right? That also helps. Um, from the team's perspective, right? One needs to learn to say the words or pronounce the words correctly. You know, some, because some some mistakes can be very costly mistakes when you you know pronounce the word and the word means something else altogether right so you need to be uh, it can be an embarrassment and and can be a distraction and people will quickly disengage so in order to facilitate that they worship well uh, or you know we uh, are leading well we need to be able to get the words understand the meaning of the words and pronounce pronounce them in the right way right um another thing would be that uh, if the worship leader knows the language and can transition into exhorting the congregation or encouraging the congregation to uh, maybe in scripture or through just an exhortation encouragement to sing and uh, you know in, enter into singing enter into deep enter deeper into worship and and all that would be an advantage right? if the worship the person who's leading um, knows the language otherwise uh, there can be another person uh, who can do that, who can ex exhort and lead, uh, or just that you know exhortation bit can be done uh, by that person who knows the language. Or right. So these are some things to um, consider when we. Um, uh, sorry, yeah. So these are some things to consider when we do this uh, additional or uh, consider the language. Uh, of the church where it is, you know, where it is situated, situate, uh, situated, um, to consider the language, to consider the uh, culture and genre of music, and so on. Right? But this is something that can really help, um, you know, when we move out of these urban settings, and if the church is not an urban church, um, but you know, if you're moving into maybe semi-urban or even rural areas, uh, this kind of an approach. Uh, is required, right? Okay. So, any questions here? Any questions? Um, how difficult or how easy is it? Um, any questions at all? No. Okay. So, um, so the thing, whole thing, is about being sensitive, right? Being sensitive, uh, being culturally sensitive, uh, being sensitive to the language uh, of that particular people group culture. Right? So, uh, it helps, right? Um, because um, otherwise, what would happen is they they are not able to. Engage deeper. You know, for example, uh, I think this this um, yeah we used to have this uh, situation in one of our locations at uh, I don't know, all people uh, at ABC South, where we had a big crowd of um, of students from a nearby college, and this was I'm talking about pre-COVID times, where almost forty of them would come every Sunday from a, uh, a nearby college, and they were all. Um, I think uh, all of them were uh, Hindi speaking and from the north and uh, north, north, uh, northern states and you know, various parts of North India. So, um, so we 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 did a point. You know, we need to have Hindi. We need to have Hindi songs um, in the church. In the church, and also, I remember we also did a foundations course uh, in Hindi, uh, like with Hindi translation. Like, just for those students, uh, at one point, right? So, so anyway, so having um, uh, having these students, so we would see the change whenever we sang a Hindi song, right? So they used to typically, you know, um, it, our, our uh, location there, it is like a L shape, you know. So you have congregation right in front of you, 
and then you have congregation on the side. So it's an L-shaped uh, hall. So you have a you know few uh, a lot of chairs here, and then some chairs here as well. So this group would come and sit. All forty of them would sit in this section, right? Um, so whenever we do a Hindi song of worship, then this section would just come alive. Right? Uh, till then, you know, the songs will be louder. We can actually hear their voices. You know, they'll be um, they're, they're deeply engaged in worship uh, and fully step in. And, and this, this whole section would just erupt. You know, you can see it. It's just like switching on, putting on a switch. It's like you know, this section would just come alive. Then we, you know, you realize that yes, they are. We are serving. We are able to serve them there because of the language, considering the language, right? Um, so that's the thing. Um, so some questions are, you know, yes, it it is. Uh, it involves a sacrifice because, um, well, the other crowd, well, they could adapt. They could uh, the other sections of the congregation. They could adapt and be, you know, mindful and be sensitive. And therefore, uh, also learn, you know, learn the songs, and uh, they can do that. So there is this aspect of, you know, that aspect of understanding, um, sacrifice, and and adapting, right? So so it can happen both ways, right? For, for the majority of the language group which is there, and for the, you know, the smaller group which is there, smaller section which is there, that both ways it could help, right? If they uh, learn and uh, are willing to adapt, um, so that could willing to step out of that comfort level and um, whatever they are just comfortable with, it will it will help, right? Yeah. Okay. So um, just a few thoughts on being culturally sensitive, you know, in worship. So what is uh, what does it mean? You know, cultural sensitivity. Um, let me just. Uh, this here in the chat okay so cultural sensitivity in worship it means um, to be aware of and to be respectful towards and inclusive of diverse cultural expressions in the worship uh, experience right so it means that you are first of all aware of what is the culture like you're aware of we know that you know, even within a church uh, or you know, different churches, the culture is different. You know, culture is uh, you know the things that we do. Maybe it could be traditions. It could be things that we value, and uh, it is something. Sometimes it's very tangible. Sometimes it's not. Right? It could be the way people dress. Right? Um, in certain churches, you see that people are dressing up very formally. Right, everybody is wearing tie, and including the pastor suits, and and that's how you know uh, everybody dresses up. It's a culture that is set. It's a un. Nobody tells them, you know, you need to dress this. You know, you need to wear a suit. You need to wear a, you know, formally and come. Nobody tells. It's it's what is set. It's the practice which is set, and it's like an unwritten guideline, and it's set by the leadership, right? Uh, and this cult, most of these things are top down. The culture is set by the leadership, and and so uh, are we sensitive to? So this is this is what culture is, right? Um, so are we sensitive to the culture when we when we facilitate lead in worship, right? So it's just being respectful. It is being it is not um, isolating sections of people, but then including them. So that is to be culturally sensitive, okay. And so, um, so to be culturally sensitive, we can actually identify worship styles. You know, right? What are some genres of music which we can identify? Now, yes, we you know in every genre of music or every every um, you know wave or move of uh, you know the songs coming up and God doing something uh, uh, and birthing new songs from you know different ministries and churches and so on. There is there is something of great value, right? Um, and uh, as we see, you know, 
uh, right from the Reformation, the kind of songs that came out, Reformation starting with Martin Luther in the 1500s, and you know the kind of songs that that came out. Um, he was he himself, Martin Luther himself, wrote many songs, <clears throat> wrote many hymns, like um, "A Mighty Fortress Is Our God," and and him and beautiful hymns like that. Which is rich in theology, so um, he he wrote such. Uh, so that came out of that Reformation movement. Um, you know, songs that taught people uh, that salvation is by grace through faith, and songs that taught about um, uh, uh, the Word of God. So it birthed out of that. Then we also see, you know, these are some things that we already studied, but we see, see uh, some restoration moves of God, and as we as we see the restorative move of uh, um, God's work through the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Spirit, and um, and uh, the gifts of the Spirit, and the supernatural works of the Spirit, so we see songs birthed out of that. You know, songs drawing people back to the heart of God, to intimacy with God. So, so in the songs, when written by the when when the Vineyard movement. Right, the vineyard churches and the vineyard movement, and when they experience the more powerful move of God and work of the Holy Spirit, the you know the songs they wrote were very radical, you know, in those times because it was it was talking about God and uh, in such tender and terms, right, the love for God in such tender terms, and um, and uh, the adoration for God uh, in such uh, such close and intimate terms. Right, intimate way. So, um, so that was uh, that was really bold, and that was really um, drawing people. It was breaking down certain things, right? breaking down certain walls, barriers. Uh, people used to relate to God. It was really, literally, like you know, uh, who we are in Christ message. It, it it changes the way you relate to God, right? Once you understand that you are justified and sanctified and you're welcomed in the presence of God and and so on it changes the way you relate to God so so this move and the and the songs that people used in worship was like that it changed the way it filled their heart with love for God and and uh, and of course the other way also that God filled their heart with love for him and with the revelation of uh, who he was and then songs were birthed out of that right so so we see that different there is value in different genre of music, right? So in every genre of music, but but culturally speaking, and um, you know, being sensitive, you know, what is the genre uh, of music that uh, that particular gr crowd is is familiar with? And you know, what is the style of music that they are familiar with? Uh, so identifying that and being sensitive to that. The language also, you know, the language, the dialect, everything matters, and and also some of the artistic elements, you know, like certain places like we need to grow in the scriptural expressions of worship that transcends culture that transcends time right when you say scriptural expression we're talking about um everything that we've learned in worship right about uh now psalm 95 talks about that you know about shouting about drawing near in worship being contemplative kneeling down uh, being prostrate in worship, and so on, like different expressions. So um, we need to understand that this covers everything, transcends. But also you need to understand that in certain cultures, dance is a very, you know, it's a way of life. It's a lifestyle. So that is something that they can easily step into. Right? Whereas... For, from certain church backgrounds and even certain cultures, dance is not so much a part of that. Right? People don't move, right? Um, there's no sense of rhythm and whatever. But then people don't move. Dance is not part of the culture, so we need to understand that. So there's no part, you know. So it needs to be a gradual transition, right? So you need to be sensitive. Oh, okay. It doesn't. Dance is not part of this. Church background, you know, they're all in pews, and you know, I've been in Methodist churches, and so the expression of worship is, you know, at, at that point was limited. Um, so limited to clapping of hands and raising of hands, and that too, you know, not everyone, right, was comfortable doing that. So it was limited in the expression. Well, we need to be culturally sensitive to that, 
and say yes this is how it is and if at all we want to move you know in the worship ministry we want to move people from where they were or where they are to greater levels of freedom and expression now that is a transition that is going to take time that is a process that one needs to be intentionally committed to in order to move right um, to greater levels of freedom greater levels of expression and worship right so so all this starts with being culturally sensitive which includes this as well right? the artistic elements and language and dialects and so on okay so when we are culturally sensitive and we when we uh, you know how can we be culturally sensitive how do we you know, um, how do we start on this journey we need to you know research we need to do some research find out look around observe um, read up do some research okay so um, so that's okay do some research find out um, now the thing is that we also need to you know, observe and learn from experience right you cannot you cannot say that okay this language this age this age group this territory okay this is how it's going to be no no it's more complex than that when you observe you realize that hey they're actually different right uh, we, we don't have we can't slot them into a particular category only when we observe we realize you know, they're different right so do some research and we can work with if there are people with different uh, from different backgrounds uh, ethnic wise language wise we can work with them so the second thing is to to meaningfully just one second sorry yeah to uh, meaningfully collaborate like work together work together and see and try and understand and work together maybe you know you have culturally or ethnically diverse people from the congregation from the uh, uh, in the team itself right so work together work with them and see okay what will what will really help build bridges what will be really um, relevant so we had when we had uh, you know uh, african students in our worship team at one point uh, we had actually three of them serving for a long time uh, you know fred and becky and andrew so they were I still remember the names. They're, they're so faithful, and you know, um, uh, the heart was so sincere, and they really wanted to serve, and they served so well for many years. And uh, so they were part of the team for many years. So we could work with them and and see, okay, what will help um, serve it, you know, serve the uh, congregation better. Right. Okay. Then also um, the multiple use of languages, like we said. And also, it will also help if we are engaged in, you know, maybe something like a cultural event. Um, so we need to be, you know, we need to understand that sometimes, you know, in our uh, in our nation, culture and truth conflict. Right? Culture is so intertwined with the faith uh, or the beliefs of the people. And so it contradicts with truth, okay, which means that um, it, it contradicts with the truth of God's word. And so the culture contradicts with the truth. So at such at such times, you know, we need, we should, we cannot embrace culture. You know, we need to let go of it. These are these are futile. Right? These are contradictory to truth. So we need to let go of it. Um, so. So, the, the, but there are some things which which do not which which are not you know which which really don't matter. Um, it's a practice. It's uh, you know it, it's it's not conflicting with the truth. It's not going to affect your you know your uh, I mean walk with God in any way. Well, there's no problem, right? Um, so these are secondary and tertiary issues. As long as the core of it, the, f the foundations of it, are untouched. Okay, so these are some things to consider when we look at um, uh, the indigenous and worship, uh, having worship in the um, language of the people. 
regional language of the people. Okay, any any thoughts, any questions? Um, maybe you can you can even share like from from where you come, okay, the bag, uh, the, the church. Uh, what is it like? What is the what are the people like? Did you encounter any you know kind of um, challenges and anything? Share that as well. Anything at all? No? OK. OK, so um, we'll, we'll stop right now. Oh, yeah, OK. Yeah, Nina, sure. Go ahead. Uh, Pastor, you're able to hear me? Yeah. Um, just what about those churches who don't really um, encourage or they don't really have a time of worship like mm. uh, what we are familiar with i mean okay those mm. who have a time set apart you know when i say worship, worshiping in song yeah but they don't have and they don't really even okay they keep it to the barest minimum like you know okay mm. and refer to it as chorus singing or something like that and right. so you know so yeah, actually, it is nice sometimes because it's a short period and they mm. do a little of exhorting. But how it's very difficult not for them to go into that time when yeah. they really are just, yeah, it doesn't happen. So, True. you know, so then, uh, so what do we, I mean, is there any role that we can play and, you know, kind of encourage or, you know, or mm. you just take it as it is and say, okay, that's yeah, how it is. Saying, and, yeah. Uh, is there hope? <laughs> asking. Okay. Yes. So, <laughs> yeah, the thing is, yes, you know, there is, but there's, um, you need loads of patience and, uh, you know, having a burden. Because, like, if you look at, um, like, some of us who come from different backgrounds, all of us are come from, coming from different backgrounds and different baggages of uh, what we believe in and, and so on. But it took a journey to come, to move to greater levels of freedom. And uh, that journey involved encounter with truth encountering God. So that is something that we can pray for because there were people who were praying. You know, for if you look at or you know some of us, the people who were praying, people who were praying for the group, people who were praying for the church. And so uh, that God would uh, uh, God would actually spark that and um, take that. So it start, you know, never forget that uh, sequence of teaching, revelation, conviction, action, destiny, right? That's a that's a pathway. And we can introduce that. Maybe we cannot. We may not be able to do it for the entire church. Uh, but how about uh, a certain, a certain group, right? Maybe a small group that meets. Maybe a, a particular age group that meets. Like you know, maybe uh, elders fellowship or children church or youth. Um, you know. So in that, there can be change, and it can be a small change. It can be a marginal change, but you know, that can be a win. And uh, and one such thing is to have you know the if not in the main service, uh, how about in the let's say uh, an evening service? So these are things that can be uh, discussed uh, with the leadership. It has to come from the leadership. Leadership has to okay it. Leadership has to be with it. Uh, really catch on the vision. And so uh, the first thing starts with prayer. Prayer for the church. Prayer for the congregation. Prayer for the leadership. And uh, and pray for you know uh, um, a a deeper walk with God and a deeper life of worship. You know, it starts there, and uh, and things would change from there on. It is possible, uh, but it has to go in, you know, uh, go slowly, but it can gain momentum. Uh, so yeah. yeah, we'll we'll take a break. We'll come back and talk more about this when we come back. Right? Yes, sure. thank you.